you might want to keep a, uh, your copy of the Word of God open this evening. To I'm probably going to be doing some reading from Revelation 13 here in just a few minutes. We've come back tonight to our Hot Summer Night series. Uh, we've covered lots of subjects, and if you want to see those subjects that we have covered for our Hot Summer Nights, you can go to bohbc.org. You can click on Media Sermons. You can find all that content there. You can also please download our church app. We, uh, we know that already we've had over 500 downloads of the church app. We're thrilled about that. But for those of you that don't have it, go to the App Store, go to Google Play. Make sure that you uh, get BOHBC on that tagline. The uh, app will come up. Download, download that to your phone. You'll find lots of content there on the app. If you're to go in there tonight on the home screen of the app, you'll see a section for sermon notes. You'll see the, the notes, the entire uh, notes section of this message tonight there. On the app, and so please make sure you take advantage of that. Uh, you can also, when this sermon is over with, find downloadable copies of those notes attached to the message. You can e you can make notes on those yourself and email them to yourself. So please take advantage of the opportunity that we have there tonight for you to have these notes at your disposal. They're under Hot Summer Nights tonight. We are talking about the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast. I bet that most of you have heard throughout your life in the church serving the Lord about the mark of the beast. What does that mean? What's that going to be like? More questions have been raised about the end of the time and the mark of the beast these days. I don't know if you have been to Walmart lately. I go quite a bit to Walmart. You've heard me talk about that before. Not any more than I really need to, but when I have to, I go to, to Walmart and I go usually just to pick up a few things, get groceries or whatever. I remember going just recently. I went to the checkout, and it's no surprise there was no cashier there, right? I mean, pretty much all the registers have been replaced by these automated machines. And so the fact that there was no cashier at the register when I went to check out, that was no surprise. But what I encountered when I got there was, and I bet some of you all have encountered this as well, when I got to one of the automated registers, it said, this register does not accept cash, electronic payments only. I don't like that because I try to deal in cash. I think it's safer to deal in cash. That keeps you out of debt, keeps you out of trouble that way. But I found out that Walmart is asking customers to use credit and debit cards amid the coronavirus pandemic Coin shortage, as it's been called. A company spokesperson, a spokesperson said this, Like most retailers, we're experiencing the effects of the national, nationwide coin shortage and we're asking customers to pay with card or use correct change when possible if they need to pay with cash. So use your credit card, use your debit card, use exact change if you have it. Matt Flynn says there is no conspiracy here. He is a chief economist at Old National Bank. He says it's simply another effect of the coronavirus. According to Flynn, there is about $48 billion of coinage in the United States, and right now those coins are hard to find. So if you've been collecting the coins at your house, please do us all a favor, take them, cash them in at the bank and get them back in circulation. Finn says it's because the U.S. Mint has slowed production of coins because of the coronavirus. Plus, fewer people have been using coins at places like vending machines and laundromats, so those coins are not being brought and cashed in. Economists hope that when the country opens again and businesses get back to normal, the problem will fix itself. But, he says, until that happens, it can actually get worse. And so we've got to prepare ourselves. Now, some have speculated that the coin shortage could be a manufactured attempt at pushing our culture towards a cashless society in which all transactions will be electronic and as such monitored by institutions and by the government. Do you ever read and see these conspiracy type theories that we see online? You know, sometimes there's an element of truth to those and sometimes maybe not. At the very least, people have begun to wonder if we have drawn closer to the end of time. Are these things that we're experiencing clear signs of the last days? Well, tonight what we're going to attempt to do is to go to God's Word for an answer to that question, focusing especially on the idea of the mark of the beast. 
So if you've got your copy of the Word of God open, I'm going to read portions here in just a moment from Revelation chapter 13. Let me ask you and try and answer some questions. The first question tonight is, what is the mark of the beast? What exactly, if if you've been a Christian, if you've been in church most of your life, you've heard the mark of the beast, but what exactly are we talking about? The mark of the beast is taken directly from the pages of Scripture in Revelation chapter 13. It's in that chapter that we're introduced to the beast from the sea, John the Apostle says, that is Antichrist, and also introduced to the beast from the earth, which is the false prophet according to John's writings. As we know, Antichrist is the charismatic figure who has been prophesied to come to power at the end of time. You've heard of Antichrist before. Daniel chapter 9, among other places, leads us to believe that Antichrist will be persuasive and that he will actually be able to bring a treaty of peace between the nations, many have surmised that maybe even perhaps this conflict that has been raging in the Holy Land among God's people and others, that the Antichrist will actually somehow be able to forge a treaty of peace between Jews and Arabs and all other factions that are fighting over the Promised Land. That could very well be the case. So in that sense, you could say that the Antichrist will be something of a globalist. You've heard that term globalist, right? Revelation 13 even makes reference to a conglomeration of nations that he will successfully unite under his leadership at the end of time. Let me say it like this. Antichrist will head up a group of nations, a global coalition... At the end of time, that's according to the Word of God. At the the side of the Antichrist, who, by the way, Antichrist and beast are interchangeable terms. This figure we're talking about tonight, sometimes 1 John in his letter to the church calls him Antichrist. In Revelation and other places, he's called the beast. But we're talking about the same person. So Antichrist, beast at his side will be the false prophet. The Bible says, if you've got your copy open there in Revelation 13, verse 13, that the false prophet performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Have I told you before that the devil has never had an original thought? He steals the work of the Lord and counterfeits it for his purpose. So we know on Mount Carmel about 3,000 years ago, a prophet, a man of God named Elijah called down fire from heaven by the power of God. And so now Satan will empower the false prophet with similar miracles that he will perform in the sight of men. Now we know that clearly he's going to be, the false prophet's going to be empowered by the great deceiver who is Satan. And the Bible also lets us know that the majority of people are going to be deceived. When you read Revelation chapter 6 through 19 that detail what's going to happen on earth during the tribulation, the worst period of time in the history of this planet, the overwhelming majority of people will not believe they will be deceived. All the more reason for you and I to give our lives to Christ right now. We've heard people say before, well, when Jesus comes back, I'll get right with God then. Don't count on it. Don't count on it. Get your life right with Christ now. Place your faith in Jesus right now. Revelation 13, 16 says this, He, the false prophet, causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand and on their foreheads. What are we to make of this? The Greek term here in the passage that is translated in my copy of the Word of God as mark is karagma, and it means a stamp or an imprinted mark. And it was a term that in Greek literature, in Greek culture, was used for the way that you would brand a horse, an impression that would be a mark that would be left on a horse when it was branded. Now, we know that the mark, according to that description, could be visible, but it's probably not outside the realm of possibility that that mark could be invisible as well. 
perhaps visible, so that people can see this person has taken the mark and anybody who has not taken the mark won't have that mark and so then they'll be subject to persecution. The Bible doesn't say exactly what the mark will be like exactly, but we do know that the mark will be apparent and that based on that mark, a person will be treated well or they will be treated terribly. So that's the mark of the beast. Now, number two, what is the purpose of this mark that we're talking about tonight? What's the purpose? The Apostle John continues in verse 17. He says, no one, and that means no one, may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So clearly... The purpose of this mark of the beast is coercion. Either you will submit to the beast or you will be denied the basic ability to live. Now, some New Testament manuscripts, as I was studying for this message, I found out they say in this passage that the name of the beast is actually the mark of the beast. That by taking the name of the beast, you're actually taking the mark. In other words, if you don't bear his name or his number, you will be denied the right to survive. That's what we're talking about. If my timeline is correct, when Christ comes back, when he raptures the church, when they meet the Lord in the air, and this world is left to the tribulation, if you don't take the mark of the beast, you will not be permitted to do anything. You will be subject to persecution. That is called coercion. And it's going to happen at the end of time. Regardless, the point is that the mark is a means of control. During the days of Antichrist, the days of what we would call the Great Tribulation, individual liberties will be forfeited to the Antichrist and his minions. Now, I think that we as Americans, we have a special idea of liberty. We have a unique and special idea of freedom because what other country on this planet has worked and labored and given blood, sweat, and tears so many times over and over to ensure that not only its residents have freedom, but residents of other countries have freedom. We are blessed in the liberties that we enjoy as citizens of the United States of America. But what I want to say to you, I'm certainly not a prophet or a son of a prophet like Amos said, but I do see every day that there are folks that are encroaching on our civil liberties. And you and I need to be mindful of that. I want to say to you tonight, sir, ma'am, there are men and women that for decades and centuries have fought for the right for you to be free today. I would encourage you, don't go handing back the liberty that others fought so hard to give you. We need to be careful about that. People have bled and died so that we can be where we are here today. At the end of time, though, you will be coerced to give away your liberty into the hand of the Antichrist. Number three, what is the number? Of the beast. We talk about the mark of the beast, but what is the number of the beast? John the Apostle Apostle answers the question in chapter 13, verse 18. He says, Here is wisdom. In other words, get your thinking caps on. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Now, what in the world are we to make of that? John tells us here in verse 18, it is the number of a man. We know that could be understood in a couple of ways, and both of them, I think, in this case could be true. Both understandings I'm going to share with you. First, 666 is the number of a real man. In this case, we're talking about the Antichrist or the beast or whatever you want to call him. The Antichrist is not the figment of someone's imagination. This is not just figurative concepts that we're talking about tonight. He is a real man, Antichrist, who will reign with an iron fist at the end of time. Sometimes people, when they 
You know, there's a whole science of what we call hermeneutics. That's biblical interpretation. And sometimes when people come to the Revelation, the Reformers fell into this camp. They said everything is a picture. Everything's an allegory. Nothing can be taken literally. Well, in this case, no. Even though we're using symbolic, even numerical language in this passage, it has a real meaning about a real person, about a real man whom we call Antichrist that is going to be revealed at the end of time. Now, furthermore, 666 is the number of man himself, or at least six. We're talking about the human being. Now, you think about this. Man, mankind, men and women were created on the sixth day, according to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And on the seventh day, God rested from his creative work. Did you ever think when you were a kid, well, God rested because after all that work, he was tired. Y'all with me out there? God didn't rest because he was tired. He rested because he was done. Amen. He got it done on six days and then set the Sabbath on the seventh where he himself rested from his labors. So man being created on the sixth day, somehow maybe even perhaps that's incorporated into this number of the beast. And, of course, we know that we're told to calculate the meaning of the number itself here, 666. So in order to calculate the meaning of that number, we'll have to look through the whole of Scripture. I talked about hermeneutics a minute ago, Bible interpretation. You know what the best way to interpret the Scripture is? It's been well said that the Bible is the best interpreter of the Bible. When you read something on page 675, that something on 675 has a context in the greater narrative of Scripture. So if we really want to know the significance of this number, then let's look throughout the Word of God to see perhaps what this number might mean. Now evangelicals tend to agree that certain numbers have a noticeable pattern in the Word of God. The number three is often used as a symbol of completion... And the number seven often represents perfection. Now that being the case, six can be understood to denote imperfection. If seven is perfection, then six is one step down denoting imperfection. And three, we've already said, symbolizes completeness. So then it appears when we use the number 666, we are talking about the complete an abject wickedness of the Antichrist. Complete wickedness, complete reprobation. As I was thinking about this earlier, I thought to myself, maybe the best way to explain it is to say that the Antichrist, the beast, is the culmination of all the world's wickedness. Abuse, hate, violence, selfishness, theft, murder, everything, all of those will be present in the Antichrist and to a degree that we have never experienced in any human being before. Complete and total wickedness, 666, the most wicked human being to ever live. We are talking about the Antichrist. That's the number of the beast. Now then number four. When will humans be forced to receive this mark of the beast that we're talking about tonight? The Bible does not tell us the exact day, the exact hour, the time that humans will be forced to take the mark, but it does lay out a discernible chain of events that will unfold at the end of time. So let me give you a little bit of timeline these last days. As we know, the signs of the times are all around us. One dear saint told me not too long ago, and I thought this was a great explanation. She said, no man knows the day or the hour when Christ will return, but the times and the seasons are obvious. Listen to me. Jesus said, you'll not know the day or the hour that Jesus is coming back, but he did say, right now, you can know the times and the seasons. He taught us to discern the signs of the times. Jesus and Paul and others throughout the word of God in particular in the New Testament, have given us lists of signs of things that would happen at the end of time. If you want to read some of those lists, I don't have the time to read all of those tonight, but you can read Matthew chapters 24 and 25. 
For Jesus, that's called the Olivet Discourse. It's one final discourse he's giving prior to his laying down his life for the sins of mankind where he's trying to let his followers know this is what's coming. So you prepare your hearts and you be men and women of God as you prepare for the end of time. One of the best lists probably in all the Word of God is in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. I've read it to you before, but when you read it, you'll have an overwhelming sense that this is the time we're living in. And surely it is. In Matthew, Jesus said, Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, Jesus said, This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all of the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. So I ask you tonight, has this gospel been preached in all the nations? Has it been preached to every people group, every tribe and tongue and nation? Well, I think only God ultimately knows the answer to that question. Missiologists can help us understand what we've done as human beings trying to reach all the corners of this planet. We know that there's places that missiologists call the 1040 window, Middle Eastern parts of our planet that are very difficult to reach, places that we have had great difficulty getting into. But I've got news for you. I think there are times and seasons, I told you before, that we are God's plan A and there is no plan B. But sometimes God intervenes in the course of human events. We have heard story from missionaries who have gone to remote parts of this planet who have come back and told us the people were ready to receive the gospel because they had been told by someone that the gospel, that an answer was coming. You say, Pastor, what are you trying to say? Well, the Bible says in Romans chapter 1 that one of these days, Romans chapter 1 verses 18 through 20, Paul says there's coming a day and a time where every man is going to stand before the Lord Jesus on the day of judgment without excuse. So let me say it like this. Not every person has the same witness that you and I have been blessed to have. How many times do you think you've heard the gospel in your life? How many times have you passed by a copy of the Word of God? How many times have you listened to a pastor or an evangelist or somebody else on the radio or on television sharing, communicating about the gospel of Christ? Many of us have had thousands upon thousands of opportunities to hear the gospel and come to faith in Christ. Some people in the course of their life may not have barely one opportunity to come to Christ. And some would say zero. Some people have zero opportunity. You say, well, how do you square that with the Lord sending people to hell who never had an opportunity to receive Him? I believe based on the testimony of the Word of God, our Lord will give every member of the human race sufficient witness of Himself so that they could place their faith in God. And one of these days, if they have not placed their faith in God, that responsibility will rest on them. But all the more urgency for you and I who have received the gospel so often and so well, not to keep it to ourselves, but to go and take it to the nations. Because there are still people who have not heard. All the more urgency for us sharing the gospel with others. Has this gospel really been preached? Worldwide, to every person, to every tribe. Well, only God knows the answers to all those questions. But we do know this. At the very least, we know that this gospel that I'm preaching to you tonight, this gospel that arisen Lord Jesus Christ has been preached on every single continent on this planet. Everywhere. And we're praying that it continues to encroach inwards into all parts of every continent so that more and more people have a greater and greater opportunity to come to faith in Jesus. So then Jesus said this gospel would be preached all over the planet in in all nations. So what are we awaiting right now? We are awaiting the time where according to what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, a trumpet is going to blast. A shout is going to be declared from heaven. The voice of the archangel is going to cry out. And the Bible says that when that time comes, Jesus Christ is going to appear in the clouds in all of His radiant glory. 
You know, the Bible says in Revelation, if you've never read this before, the Bible says in Revelation, even those who pierced him will see him. Even those who pierced him, they've been dead for years, but somehow by the power of God in whatever state, wherever they are, whatever destination they have come to eternally, they are going to see the Lord Jesus Christ. That's called the rapture. The reason it's called the rapture the Latin Vulgate, when it translated 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it used the word rapturo, to be caught up, to be taken up. And so what Paul says there is that we are going to be caught up in the air to meet our Lord Jesus Christ. He says when Jesus comes back, when that trumpet resounds, he says that the dead in Christ are going to rise first. Their souls being rejoined with a glorified body and those of us who are alive and remain, our bodies will be transformed in an instant. We will be like unto that of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're awaiting right now. We call that the rapture. Now when that rapture takes place, when that catching up of the, of the church, of the saints of God from every age, when that happens, the Bible tells us at that point that a period that is called tribulation is going to be set off on this earth. Again, I don't have enough time to look into all this tonight, but if you were to go and to look at Daniel chapter 9, that's a 70 weeks prophecy that you can find there. 69 weeks in Daniel's prophecy have been fulfilled. They were fulfilled in the 483 years prior to the coming of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But then there's one seven-year period left. And according to the testimony of the Word of God, we believe that is the period of the tribulation. It is going to be the closest thing to hell on earth that this world has ever seen. If you don't believe me, read Revelation chapter 6 through 19. They record the terrible details of things that are going to happen during that horrible, awful period of time. Locust, pestilence, Fire and brimstone raining down from the heavens. Water turned to blood. Like a return of the Egyptian plagues, except only on a global scale. Catastrophe. The natural reading of Scripture leads us to believe that the mark of the beast will be implemented during the tribulation. So for all those people who say, well, I'll wait till Jesus comes back. Understand the things we're talking about tonight will unfold after the church has been raptured to go and to meet the Lord in the air. So that being said, it would come as no surprise if the groundwork for the mark of the beast that we're talking about tonight were already being put in place. So let me talk to you about that for just a few more minutes tonight before we're done. Number five, how is the world being prepared for this mark of the beast that we've been talking about. This is a question that the Bible does not provide an explicit answer to. The Bible provides a great deal of detail about the times and the seasons that we've talked about and also about the events that will occur when Jesus comes back. But we don't get too many details about the events preceding the tribulation that we've been talking about. So then we'll have to use some deductive reasoning. Revelation chapter 13 leads us to believe that Antichrist will lead a confederacy of nations at the end of time. Antichrist is going to rise up. He's going to come to power and he's going to join a confederacy of nations, world powers together. One of the last bold judgments you can read about in Revelation 16 tells us that these nations led by Antichrist, will go to war with Jesus at the end of time. That final battle is called Armageddon. Armageddon is the real translation of that, the hill of Megiddo, and it will take place in the valley of Megiddo. Some of you have been blessed enough to go to Israel to see the land for yourself. If you have never been, one of these days I'm going to get another trip up. We're going to go back. When you stand on the hill of Megiddo and you look out on the valley of Megiddo, it is a perfect setup for a colossal battle at the end of time. 
And the scripture tells us it's going to be right there in Revelation chapter 16, verse 16. We call it Armageddon. One of the last great judgments of the tribulation says there in that passage in Revelation 16 that the Euphrates, modern day Iraq, will be dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. What are they talking about? That the water of a great, the, rather the, the water of this great body, of this river, would be dried up so that the kings from the east can begin to make their way to the valley of Megiddo for this final battle. That, side, that said, Antichrist will have sovereign control over these nations from across the globe at the end of time. That's why our ears, I believe, should perk up when we hear people talking about globalization. Have you heard that term in the media the last few years? They talk about the global economy. Sometimes they say things about a one world government. Now, one world government is the concept of a common political authority for all of humanity giving way to a global government in a single state or polity with jurisdiction over the entire world. So we know as Americans we have federal, state, local governments. What they're saying is you add one more on top of that and it will supersede all governments and we call that a one world government or as some have called it before, perhaps a new world order. Such a government could come into existence either through violent and compulsory means, world domination, or through peaceful and voluntary supernatural unions, political leaders giving sovereignty to a greater sovereign. Now we know that kings and kingdoms have pursued worldwide domination, dominion from the beginning of time, but the idea of a one world government, in my opinion, is a little different than the idea of world domination. Ancient empires have sought to conquer the world, even all the way down to the 20th century. Wasn't it Hitler's plan to conquer the entire world, to have domination, to do that by military conquest? But modern concepts of one world government revolve much more around the voluntary creation of a single entity that would essentially remove the need for all other governments, the ones we talked about earlier. Advocates of one world government typically seek consent for the new government rather than coercion. They come together, the leaders of this world come together, we believe, and they begin to put the wheels in motion. You say, well, how long have people been talking about the possibility of a one world government? Can I give you a voice of one of our past presidents? And I'm not talking about the 90s. I'm not talking about the 60s. I'm talking about the 1870s. Ulysses S. Grant once said, I believe at some future day, the nations of the earth will agree on some sort of Congress which will take cognizance of international questions of difficulty and whose decisions will be as binding as the decisions of the Supreme Court upon us. Ulysses S. Grant said that over 130, about 150 years ago now. H.G. Wells was a strong proponent of the creation of a world state. You've heard the author A.G. Wells before. <coughs> he argued that such a state would ensure world peace and justice. Rest assured, though, that when a one world government is attempted, it will be in the name of universal peace and justice. One of the great experiments, friend, of the 20th century was socialism and Marxism and communism. And in case you didn't get the memo, it failed miserably. Atheists thought they could construct a system where ultimately all governments would be disbanded and then we would have a classless society and all together as the human race we could usher in a utopia. If you believe that, I've got oceanfront property for you in Kansas. Amen. Haven't we got the memo that people are wicked and sinful in need of Jesus? 
Ever since the beginning of time, Adam and Eve, their own children, one brother rose up against another brother to kill him. And they were one generation removed from the Garden of Eden. What makes us think now that we being all these other generations removed from the Garden of Eden can somehow by ourselves without the intervention of God make a return to the Garden of Eden? That is the communist pot dream. And every single time it's been attempted, it has failed miserably. And I also have news for you. Millions of people have been killed through genocide because of Marxist, socialist, communist policies. Genocide. But... Leaders have said many times over, we have a way. If we, if we create a one world government, we can bring in a universal peace and justice for all men, for all of humanity. There has never been an executive, legislature, judiciary, military, or a constitution with global jurisdiction. Never in the course of human history. The United Nations, I know we hear much about them. They are limited to a mostly advisory role and its stated purpose is to foster cooperation among governments rather than exerting any kind of authority over them. So what we're saying is that the nations participate voluntarily or supposedly. Now there are groups such as G20, maybe you've heard about in the media over the course of the past several years. G20 is an association of 20 developing and established nations and entities, including the European Union. So I'm asking you, could Antichrist manipulate these sorts of groups, these sorts of, sorts of global initiatives and in his attempts to achieve worldwide dominion? I think absolutely he could. And with the false prophet at his side, all the nations, I believe, will be persuaded to join the rebellion against our Savior Christ. Now, what about international digital ID? I had a man who's a, a leader, a political leader, reach out to me yesterday, whom I love and I respect very much. I am telling you, people are looking at these things. Our decision makers, our leaders are looking at these things. And when you have leaders, when you have important, prominent people calling hillbilly pastors like me and saying, hey, can you help us understand from the Word of God what's going on? The Lord's on the move. What about an international digital ID? Bill Gates, the Microsoft tycoon, is leading an initiative called ID2020. I don't know if you've read about this or not. It is an attempt at providing digital identification for every person in the world. We are told that identity, quote, identity is vital for political, economic, and social opportunity. They also tell us, quote, for over a billion people, systems of identification are inaccessible. In other words, there are one billion people on this planet who don't have any real meaningful means of identification that's inaccessible information. So for that reason, since 2016, ID2020 has advocated for ethical privacy protecting approaches, they say, to digital identification they tell us in their own words that new forms of digital ID will allow us to travel, conduct business, access financial and health records, stay connected, and much more. We're also told that biometrics will be used to identify the world's population through projects like ID 2020. A similar product or project details their process a little better the information, by the way, on some of the things that you read about this is sketchy. It's hard to find. I don't think they want to be very forthcoming about what it involves. But some people give us more information. One company said this. Biometrics are securely captured through fingerprints, voice, face, or an iris scan. Now, beyond biometrics, we're also being told that ID2020 could be used to help provide vaccinations to the world's population. We've heard a lot about vaccines lately. Bill Gates even hired a company that looked into the addition. You can Google this and find it yourself. The addition of a quantum dot inside vaccines. Let me say that one more time. A quantum dot 
technology inside the vaccine. They say that the quantum dot will deliver patterns of near-infrared light emitting microparticles to the skin that can, when exposed to certain frequencies of light, identify the immunization status of infants. Let me put that in layman's terms. We're going to put something in a vaccine and then later on, if you put an infrared light over that child or that, over that infant, that will demonstrate whether or not that child has received that vaccine. Others are electing other forms of digital identification. In August of 2017, this is true, 50 employees at Three Square Market got RFID chips in their hands, implanted in their hands. Now, 80 of the employees had them. The chips that he and his employees got are about the size of a very large grain of rice. Have you seen these in news reports in the media before? The chips are intended to make life a little easier, to do things like getting into the office. You ever have a, a card or a fob for your office? Well, now you'll just put it in your hand. Log on to computers, buy food and drinks in the company cafeteria. That sounds like commerce. Commerce through a microchip. The fact is, friend, the technology already exists. It is already being used in America and other countries. And it could certainly be used by the Antichrist to force coercion, to control commerce... And when you tell people they can no longer trade or buy or sell, then you have them under your control. Number six, final question. What is the Christian response to all these things we've been discussing about the mark of the beast? First, we should not be the least bit surprised that technology is being put in place to identify every person in the world. Technology that could also be utilized to control commerce. I mean, we knew this day was going to come, right? Are there positive things that could come about by identifying people, giving them an identity, providing them care? Absolutely, yes. I don't think anybody disagrees with that. I think the concern is that when it gets placed into the hands of the wrong people, it can be utilized to do wicked, coercive things. Now, on the other hand, we shouldn't see every new piece of technology as a tool the devil intended to bring down the human race. All of us benefit from modern technology every day. I bet you've probably got a phone there close by you. We've got laptops. We've got televisions. We've got many modern conveniences. So we all benefit from technology every day. So we don't want to vilify all forms of technology. We need to take the technology at our disposal and use it for the glory of God, whether it is that phone you've got in your hand or computers or social media, the Internet. Churches, by the way, have even tried to utilize technology. You know, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22, I become all things to all men that by all means I might save some. Listen, as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to use every tool at our disposal. If it's not wicked, if it's not sinful, we're going to use it for the glory of God, the welfare of the church, and the salvation of the lost. And churches, especially as we've come into the 21st century, have utilized things like online giving, which as our financial statement has demonstrated tonight, has been a blessing to the body of Christ. And we thank the Lord for the technology we can use to further the kingdom work of the Lord. We need to be students of Scripture and we need to remind ourselves of the signs surrounding Christ's return. If we look into those, it's clear that the signs of the times are all around us. It's also very clear that more technology is in place to accomplish the Antichrist agenda than there has ever been. That's why I think, and again, only the Lord knows the day and the time. But that's why I think we're drawing so close. The technology I've demonstrated hopefully here tonight exists to bring the entire world population together. And when every person from every place, 
every race, every country has been brought together on such a global scale. The manipulation of all the global race can begin. And we know already in many places it, it has begun. Now, that being the case, we need to rise up and understand the urgency of this moment If you and I have lost friends and family members and neighbors and others, now is the time to attempt to lead our people in our circle of influence to faith in Christ. Jesus said in John chapter 9 verse 4, I must, Jesus said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is still day for the night is coming when no man can work. Sometimes I drive through my subdivision. I do this myself. Sometimes in the heat of the day, even though it's upwards of 90 degrees now, you go outside and you fire up the lawnmower. It'd be much better, it'd be much cooler to do it at night when it might be 75 or 70 degrees outside or maybe even dipping down to the 60s on some cool summer nights. But if I mowed my yard at night, it wouldn't look so good. See, what I'm saying is work is supposed to be done during the day and then when the night comes, the work comes to an end. Jesus said right now, we are in the day of human history. He said right now is the time for me to do the work and I must do the work that my Father has called me to do because the night is coming when no man can work. If that was the urgency of our Savior, that needs to be our urgency as well. Friend, you may not have tomorrow to lead your parent to Christ. You may not have tomorrow to lead your child to Christ. You may not have tomorrow to lead your neighbor to Christ. And even if the Lord tarries His coming, what's any guarantee that you're going to be here tomorrow, that I'm going to be here tomorrow? We've got to take advantage of every moment that the Lord has placed at our disposal. Now is the time, Jesus said. When Jesus comes back, it's too late. Make sure your spouse is ready, your kids, your neighbors, your classmates, all of these. Now is the time. One thing we do not need to do. Sometimes I preach on these sorts of things, the events, Antichrist all these terrible things, bold judgments, seal judgments, things that are happening at the end of time. And people come to me sometimes and say things basically like, Pastor, you're scaring me with this stuff. You're scaring me with this. I've got news for you. If you have been born again by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, you must not be afraid. When we see currency disappear, and it will. When we see one world authority being established, and it will. When we see people being forced to identify themselves, and they will, what we must not do is be afraid. No matter whatever we go through, there is such a beautiful passage of the Word of God that reminds us, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. So no matter where I am, no matter what I'm doing, I don't have to be afraid of anything, nothing. Because God's my Father and Christ is my Savior and the Holy Spirit has sealed me and He's my helper. I look at great men and women of God, men like Stephen. Remember when Stephen had his last moments, the Bible says that they ran after him to silence him and he should have known right then, I need to be quiet now because I'm about to die. And the Bible says that he looked up to the heavens and he saw Jesus standing at the right of God, right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And when he said that, when he refused to stop speaking, they stoned him to death. But he was not afraid to die. Because he knew that upon his passing, he was going to be in the presence of Jesus. The Apostle Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You and I have nothing to fear as followers of Christ. I say to you tonight, in the wake of this mark of the beast, keep living your life and pressing forward with Jesus. You might be cited. You might be convicted. You might be in prison. You might be killed one of these days for your faith in Jesus Christ. And if that happens to be the case, well then guess what? You're in good company. Because every one of Christ's closest followers died a martyr's death. 
except the Apostle John, and he wound up exiled on a rock quarry called Patmos, where I believe the Lord kept him alive so that he could give us the revelation. If you lose your life for the cause of Christ, you're in good company. Many others have done the same thing before you. Paul said it best, Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. As long as I live, I'm going to shine for Christ, and if they take my life, then guess what? I get to go be with Jesus. You've heard me say before, and I'm not trying to be callous, but listen to me, the greatest thing that could happen to a child of God beyond their salvation is for them to pass away. Because when they pass away, they enter into the presence of Almighty God. I don't have a death wish for any one of us here tonight, including myself. Listen, I still got work I believe the Lord's called me to do, but when my work is done, I'm ready to go be with Jesus. And I hope you are too. Paul said to live is Christ and to die is gain. So that being the case, don't give up, don't shut up. Keep sharing Jesus and loving others as long as there's breath in your lungs. Let me finish with this thought. If you have been marked by Christ, then you don't need to be concerned about the mark of the beast. You say, well, how do I know that I've been marked by Christ? Well, if you placed your faith in Jesus, you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. You know what the Apostle Paul said about that? See, there's the mark of the beast. There's an impression from the beast, but there's also an impression from God himself, and it's the Holy Spirit sealed and stamped on your life. And Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, and then again in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, he is the earnest, he is the guarantee of our redemption. You say, you Baptists, you talk about eternal security. Why do y'all believe in eternal security? Because I don't believe God's a liar. Now, I'm not saying anything about anybody else's faith. If you're asking me, this is why I believe in eternal security. You know why? Because the Bible says, read it for yourself, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, that when you were saved, the Holy Spirit sealed you with the Holy Spirit of promise. You know what the old King James says in that passage? That the Spirit is the earnest. He is the guarantee of our future glory. When God saved you, He sealed you with the Holy Spirit, and that seal of the Holy Spirit is a guarantee from God Himself that you will not suffer forever in hell, but when your life is done, you will be ushered into the presence of Jesus Christ. You say, are you sure about that? Well, Titus chapter 1 verse 2 says this, God can do all things. We know God can do all things. The only things that God cannot do are the things that He limits Himself not to do. Things that are contradictory to His character as sinless and perfect and holy. And you know what Paul said in Titus chapter 1 verse 2? God cannot lie. Everybody in the world, all the people you come into contact with, they are susceptible, they are possible, they are in some cases likely to tell you a lie, but God will never lie to you. And what I'm saying to you is if you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit, that is a promise from God that you are forever saved and you will never be lost again. You say, well, all you Baptists, you believe in cheap grace. No, here's what I'm saying to you. I had somebody say to me the other day, a man that I love and respect, He said, I've got a brother who's Catholic. I've tried to witness to him. He said, you know, he thinks that, uh, he says things to me like, you know, you think just because I'm Catholic, I'm not going to go to heaven. You know what my response to that would be? I would say, just because you're Baptist, you're not going to heaven. It doesn't matter what label you put on. It doesn't matter what church membership your, your, your membership is that. Look, unless you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit through faith in Christ, that church roster doesn't mean a thing. Your denomination doesn't mean a thing. You and I need to make sure we have placed our faith and our trust in Jesus. And if we've done that, we've been marked by God and we don't need to fear the mark of the beast.